For those who were with us last week and those who were not with us last week, I'll say that you know I have set myself the task of somehow taking the four Sundays that come in this early part of the summer, taking the gospel lessons and somehow finding a way to connect them. It will be easy in these stories that seem to have nothing to do with one another to tell some interesting story and move on and be done with it. But I think it's useful to be reminded that in fact what we're hearing about in the whole of the Bible, in the whole of our Christian life, has something to say about who God is, who we are as followers and children of God, and what the presence of God means. So last week we heard the story of the storm on the Sea of Galilee when the boat was being swamped, and I talked about the presence of God in chaos and crisis. Now this week I'm going to pick up these healing stories and see what I can do with them. I begin by saying that as I was searching around for material this week, I read an article uh, that was shocking. It said that in, in, at the end of last year, ChatGPT passed the USMLE. Now, one person in the room knows what I'm talking about, probably two of you do. But for those who are not really into acronyms and, and the, the geekiness of the world presently, ChatGPT, you may know, is an artificial intelligence program. For those who have any role in education, the main concern is that it's probably writing students' papers now. And it, it's so good that you can't always tell the difference between the real thing and what has been done by a machine except occasionally it's too good based on what you already know of what the student is capable of. That's a whole other story. But it was somehow taught enough that it was able to pass the United States Medical Licensing Exam, the test that medical graduates have to take in order to practice medicine. Now somehow this, this machine is smart enough now, in theory, to do what a physician does. If that's not enough, the article went on to say that those who had been responsible for this little project were thinking that the next thing to do would be to teach ChatGPT to deliver what they described as textbook empathy. That really should make you stop and wonder. So in other words, the machine will now also act like it cares about you. All of this should make us worried, although luckily they did a survey of tech people and physicians and some other groups of people. And the conclusion from the majority was they really would rather get their medical information from a person rather than from a computer. And that should be a great relief to all of us, I guess. <clears throat> In any event, all of this, I think, makes us wonder what exactly healing is. Is it really just about patching you up? Is it really just about connecting enough dots to know what's wrong, to give you the pill you need, or to cut at the right place and sew up and whatever else and send you on your way? Is it really just about sort of adaptation? Okay, you can't do this anymore on your own, but if you take this pill, it'll fill in for it, kind of, sort of, with some side effects. And although you won't be quite like you were before, you'll kind of be functional. Is that really what healing is supposed to be? Is it really just about solving a problem? I think we who have some experience of the message of the gospel, the message of God to humanity, is that in fact, it's something else. It's about restoration and transformation. Somehow it's not simply about being sewn up, but rather about becoming whom God really intends us to be. Certainly every year we sing in a Christmas carol, risen with healing in his wings. There's something about the nature and presence of God's Messiah among us that is meant to be healing. And it's not wise, I think, to try to make that into too spiritual a thing. I mean, there, there needs to be genuine healing of the wrongs and problems that we see in the world, the brokenness of creation. We get at that with the line from Revelation where it says, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Somehow the presence of the perfection of God coming into being in the world is meant to heal everything. And that isn't just a Christian idea. We inherit this from Judaism. There is the concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, the healing of the world, the healing of the universe. Now, over the centuries, the rabbis have disagreed about exactly what that means and exactly how any individual believer goes about doing that. But nonetheless, the idea is still there that somehow God does desire healing and that God is in some way healing in God's presence among us. And so it is that I want to suggest to you that the presence of God that we see in these stories is the presence of God in healing and transformation. 
But as I did last week, I want to start with some of the clue and key phrases that I think are hidden in this story as it's, it's read to us. The first one is, is right there at the beginning. It says that the leader of the synagogue came and begged Jesus repeatedly, and Jesus went. It's a little bit less clear in the story that comes in the middle, but it's there also. This woman who has this hemorrhage, who has been suffering with it for years and years, has been trying to do something about it. She's consulted many physicians and spent all that she has, and yet she's gotten no better. Even so, she's continued to ask, help me, fix me, help do whatever you can for me. There's been that asking going on in her life even if perhaps she didn't necessarily express it in that way every time. There's something powerful about asking. We'll come back to that, so for now, just put a pin in it. But that's a key thing in this story and about our understanding of the presence of God. The next is the line, she felt in her body that she was healed. So often we tend to spiritualize and make everything metaphorical. Here, I think, is evidence that we shouldn't do that, that in fact, there is something real and physical and present in our reality that we ought to be expecting to see in the healing that God pours out over the world and over each one of us. She felt it. She didn't just see it from the the neck up, but it was somehow a, a complete experience. There is something about that that's supposed to be telling us how we're supposed to feel our faith and the consequences of our faith. How many of us come to church every Sunday and go away with that sense that our grandmothers probably had, that it was a a, a nice message and we, we sang some nice songs and we feel a little better and we'll go away and we go back out into the same world we left, no better than it was before and with nothing more to show for the time we've spent. Somehow our encounters with God should transform us, and we should expect to see that. Again, put a pen in it, we'll come back to it. The third is, he felt power go out from him. This is one of those rare occasions, I think, when we get a peek behind the curtain at the reality of God. That somehow when something happens in our human reality, when someone is blessed in some way, when someone is changed in some way, God feels it. I mean, this is completely over against ChatGPT being your new physician. It's not going to feel it. This is telling us that there is something about the reality of God that interacts with the reality of each one of us. And that God is indeed moved by our suffering by our loss, by our despair, but also by our healing and by our joy and by our transformation. Also, and one that will come up again and again over the next few months as we begin to talk about God's economy, there's the idea that power went out from Jesus and yet somehow he wasn't knocked on the floor by it. It wasn't like he was drained like a battery and had to recharge. Enough power went out from him to dramatically change a life And he was the same Jesus. There's something about that idea that the power of God, the gift of God is given without anything lost in the nature or substance of God. That's really important. That we're never afraid to ask one too many times. And then the last one, and by far my favorite, every time I read this story, I wrote my master's thesis at Yale, by the way, on these healing stories, and I kind of got carried away talking about this particular one. Give her something to eat. What a lovely expression. It's not at all what you expect to come at the end of the story. You expect Jesus to say something like, and now go to the temple and make a thank offering for what you have received from God. Now pray and be grateful to God. Now make a memory of this day and celebrate it as an annual festival. He doesn't say any of that. He says, give her something to eat. It's right here in our reality. It's very organic. What a lovely statement about what it means to somehow be transformed and yet to be in this world. The next meal still is going to come. Okay, with those as our keys and as our clues, I can say a few things, I think, about these stories. The first thing that I particularly want us to see is that both of these main characters are revived in some way, even though it may appear to be a different way. 
I mean, the, the child, who probably has most of her life ahead of her, is literally brought back into the world of the living, and so is, is plainly transformed in a way that we would recognize immediately. I mean, she was dead, and now she's not. Simple enough to see. The woman, however, is also transformed. On the one hand, she has, in a way, been pouring out her life for all of these years. She has, has literally bled away her life and has spent everything she has to try to fix it. I don't know how many of you know or are, in fact, someone who has had a chronic illness, but for many people, it becomes their entire life. It's all they can do. Clearly, that was all she could do in her life. How many lovely possibilities, how many blessings were denied her because she had to spend all of her time and energy and resources on this? And so she has been revived in the sense that her life has been given back to her. At the same time, not to get too historical, at the time you'll know that perhaps, uh, you, you may know that a woman who was menstruating as it was the case in many cultures, was in some ways separate from the community. There are cultures that well into the 19th century uh, had separate houses where women went and lived while they were menstruating. This woman, imagine, it, it's happened to her every day, 24-7, every day of the month, every day of the year for years. She has been completely denied her own community and her own place in it. She has been revived in the sense that now she is restored to everyone else, and everyone else is restored to her. Imagine what it would be like if, if, if after years and years of having no one speak to you, no one have a meal with you, no one live with you, no one do anything with you, suddenly all of that is handed back to you. These two stories are sometimes seen as... as an odd way where one interrupts the other. Most of the, those, the, the professional commentators on this story in the gospel talk about how the one story starts, then the other one interrupts it, then the other one returns. I want to suggest to you that in some ways they really are connected. They're talking about this, this wholeness that God desires for us, that in fact healing and revival and transformation are to come in every imaginable form, that there will be no limit to what it is that God desires to pour out on us and on the world. I've spoken to you before about the World Health Organization's definition of health. You might imagine that it's uh, the absence of disease, but it's not. What they say is that the, the, the definition of health is complete physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health. That's a tall order. And there will be plenty of people employed in public health for the rest of human history trying to achieve it. But nonetheless, there it is. And I think it's a pretty good definition of what it is that God desires for all of creation as well. Turning then to the next, the idea of asking. We see two kinds of, of asking in this story, two kinds of, of prayer, I'll suggest. One is petition and the other is intercession. The woman who is healed in the middle story is offering a petition. She goes and asks on her own behalf to be healed, while the leader of the synagogue goes and asks on behalf of his daughter that she might be healed. So petition and intercession. It's worth asking what the two kinds of prayer are good for and how it is that who it is that's transformed by each of them. I can say petition is hard for us. I, I will tell a story on myself. Since I have been ordained for the last 15 or 16 years, I have discovered that I am absolutely shameless in asking people for money when it's not for my own benefit. I'm pretty good at it. Believe me, I'll come to you and I'll ask you to get your checkbook out sooner or later. And it won't be for gift cards by an email. Let me just make that very clear. I will never email you and say I need to buy gift cards. Just keep that in mind, please. On the other hand, if I'm short five bucks myself, I am way too proud to ask anybody to pay for anything for me. The idea of asking for anything for myself is really very difficult. And yet, it is part of what God calls each one of us to do. 
Elsewhere in the gospel, when Jesus is particularly exasperated with his audience, he says, you do not receive because you do not ask. Well, why don't we ask? Well, I'm not really worth it. I don't really need it. I can make... Well, no. How can we possibly know the fullness of God's grace if we do not ask God to pour that grace out on us? We may not get exactly what we want, but the grace will come. And the same is true of intercession. It, it's often easier for us, I think, to ask on behalf of others. We don't do enough of it, I don't think. As often as I can in the prayers, particularly on Wednesday, I try to throw in a curve and say that we're praying for the people who have no one to pray for them and the people whose needs we don't even know. Because if we're honest with ourselves, dear friends, there are so many needs in this world that we have no conception of that we never see we never have any contact with, the least we can do, literally the least we can do, is pray to God for all of those orphan causes, all of those people who suffer in silence, all of those people whom we will never, ever see. How much easier must it have been for the leader of the synagogue to do that for his daughter? And in that process, I think all kinds of people in this story were transformed. Plainly, the two principal characters were, but so were the people who were around them. It, it's pretty clear in the story of the little girl. Her parents plainly were changed by this experience. Parents do not expect to bury their children. You can be sure that the next day and the next day and the next day, they were different people because their dead daughter was alive again. It might be a little less clear in the middle story, but maybe not. This is one of those rare occasions when you really can't make the mistake of thinking that this was something that happened in a spotlight with them completely by themselves, just Jesus and this woman. We know there was a huge crowd pushing in around them on every side. Have you ever been in that sort of situation? I have. I was once in, in, in Pakistan, in a city way up in the north of Pakistan, uh, in a market where the crowd was just the crowd, and it, it was, there was nowhere for anyone to go, a narrow little space, and we were pushed in on every side. It's a, a really nervous-making feeling to be unable to not be in contact with people around you. So in this case, surely everybody who was around was affected by what happened to this woman, if only because a space had to clear so that the scene could go on with the woman talking to Jesus. Everybody who saw this would have gone away saying, guess what I saw today? And the story would have spread in much the way that the story of the reviving of the little girl would have spread. Jesus said, tell no one. Yeah, like that's going to work. So everyone in contact, even tangentially with these stories, has been transformed. And that, I think, comes right down to you and to me here in this room today who have heard the stories again. We who go away aware somehow of the presence of God. And then to finish that idea off, we go back again to my favorite line, give her something to eat. This, I think, is the surest way of, in, of making sure that we do not over-spiritualize. Give her something to eat is, in fact, a direct instruction from the Son of God to people. We do a good job of that here. We feed a lot of people. How many other ways are there for us to live out, to give her something to eat here? Give him a job. Give her a place to live. Give them the education that they need. Give them the justice that they cry out for. All of these things are in that category. This is what makes it real. This is what makes it present here among us and why we cannot go away just smiling and nodding and saying we have been changed unless we're willing to go out and give her something to eat. So, in the presence of God in transformation and in healing... We all see it in our lives. How often do we completely ignore it? My challenge to you is go out this week and see it. Notice it. Name it. Participate in it. Find them and give them something to eat.
Amen.